is wearing his heels. So on this episode, I'm joined by a fellow Kofskin. He's played over 300 games in the championship. We go back a long way. 20 odd years. Good friend of mine. The great, the powerful Ben Gulliver. We were chatting just before over an extra hot flat white oat milk, <laughs> but not too hot. Mate, as if you ordered that. It's a disgrace. You're from commentary. I know. Yeah. I, I actually know. showed the woman and said, is this real? You said, yeah, I'll make it for you now. That's she what knew happens. who you were. I know. I, I, I know, exactly. I've been in a few times. But nosebleed, being in London or not? not I mean, you're you're further south now, aren't you? You're Plymouth. I'm down, yeah, in the southwest, which is, yeah, nosebleed. It's been a while since I've been up, up to London. I used to come down a bit when I lived in Bedford. But, yeah, I got here in one shot, which I'm quite happy with. But, yeah, it's because the southwest is so, you feel so isolated down there. It's his own little world. Being up here, I felt like I was coming on holiday. And obviously, we've been through a bit of a mill. I was, I was pretty excited just to get on the train and sit in first class, which you didn't book. I did offer to book it, <laughs> but you wanted an open return, which turned out to be, actually, it w- would have worked out cheaper to go to Dubai. That's, yeah, as in, than the first class to Plymouth, I thought, there's no chance. How much was it? It was about 350 quid. I don't yeah. know how you'd get to Dubai on that. But right, one way. Yeah, very true. <laughs> very true. <laughs> Coming home. But we're here, yeah. and... It's class, and we were talking before. So for the listeners who don't know, me and Gully go back. I worked it out. It's 20 years or more. It's actually more. It's 22 years. So you'd have been 16. When so I... how long's that then? <laughs> <laughs> I, would have, I was 16. Well, I don't like saying how old I am. Yes, yeah, so that's 22 years. Is that 22 years? So actually, yeah. you're one of the longest persons... <laughs> people's People. lads that I chat to in terms of going back historically like you'd yeah. be my oldest you'd be my oldest mate that's what oh, I'm trying to say are we friends we are of course yeah. we are we no. go back that long so when I was looking back yeah on my career and before obviously coming to the podcast with you I was thinking I've known you longer than I've known myself <laughs> but you've also seen me yeah. go from 16 right. <laughs> to where I'm now like and, and, and you know, and vice yeah. versa as well. Yeah. yeah so I, I, I think my earliest memory of you, there's, there's that picture that knocks around, isn't there, when we're playing for Barkers? And mate, I was, I was trying to think of an animal you looked like because you were, you were so, you were big, weren't you? T- you were like what, eighteen stone, six, seven, or whatever you were at sixteen. Yeah. I remember, I remember me and my old man picking you up from Job's Lane or Job's Lane for the cough folk. <laughs> <laughs> Job's Lane for the posh cough folk. But yeah, uh, which is neither of us. Mm. Um, and my dad had a Nissan Micra. I don't know if you remember this. I remember Big Tone. We yeah. can get onto him. Yeah, and um, we picked you up to take you to training a couple of times, and it was that period of where I w- I wasn't sure if I wanted to be at Barker's at the time. I was I wanted to be a motocross rider. What, what's that about? But I used to do that on Sundays, and then uh, we took you up to to training, and we 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 played a bit of Colts together, didn't we? Um, and it's it's all a bit of a blur, but it's just, it's a, they're good memories. I kind of remember because we were obviously a couple of years older than you, and we kind of—I don't know what it was. Me and the old man, we liked you, and we like put our arm around you a little bit, didn't we? Because absolutely, it was a, because it wasn't—I don't know. Because we weren't sure where York. If you were going to play rugby, even were you? It's like you're going to be a rugby player. You're tall. You're massive. Leicester want you. You want to do this. You want to do that. And I could see you getting pulled from all angles, and it was just like, mate, just come and play rugby and enjoy it, mm. and we're going to have a good crack. And I think I think we did. But like you said, that's. That's 22 years ago, it's and we've just, I don't know, so it's great with watching your career over the years, but also having those moments through that period where you just hook up for a beer or you chat, and it's like like the old days in Cov. Yeah, like nothing's yeah. happened. It, yeah. You know, when I look back, and we spoke about it before, I don't look back that much. I, I try not to reflect. I don't know why. I almost feel a little bit embarrassed I, yeah. if, if, for a number of reasons. Like one would be, probably how my career went and a lot of people why would you be embarrassed by your career because it was never meant to go that way i'm not playing myself down here i'm not like doing self deprecation it's more about especially when i go back to cov that's what i'm saying so when i go back to coventry yeah and i go back to the old haunts and i see ex teammates ex not ex friends like you know lads i was mates Acquaint- with acquaintances acquaintances yeah. and mates and stuff like yeah. that who 
grew up near me, were at Barker Butts. Let's be honest, if we're being honest here, when you looked at who was in in our team, you know, your Medis, your Mozers, uh, even Lawrence Reedy, um, Alex Brown at Scrum Half, yourself, yeah. there was a bloody uh, David uh, Campo. Campo, yeah. There were some quality players there. Where I wasn't, apart from being a big unit, which is why I got to where I got to. Yeah. Well, it opened a door, Jim. It opened the door, but how bad, but how bad was I? <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I, that, that's how I, I remember. Okay. I remember being, I, I just remember I was shy at rugby and I could fight a little bit and I was big. I, I remember you, like, you were one of the best players in the team. That's what, I, as in, in my memory, that's yeah. what I have. I have you, Medi, Campo, uh, Lawrence Reedy to a degree, Mozza in the back row. It was a fucking good team, wasn't it? It was, a, ble- it was a bloody good team. Jim, I, I, I can't remember you playing, mate. Maybe that's. I didn't it. play. That was right. Yeah. So that's that. I'm trying to think like what sort of player. Now we, we played in the Colts. Yeah. A little bit together. I played in the fourth team at Barker Butts, right? Oh, did you? The fourth team men's team, and because I was 16, going through a shit time at home. At school, there was a connection between my school, Cowan and Court, and Barker Butts. Yeah. And I got brought up to the club. David Medcraft, Meddy, who was one of the best players in Warwickshire at no, the time. He was, fuck he was quality, mate. Yeah, uh, I always remember when we were at school on his team sheet or on the, the team sheet, it had David Medcraft, utility player. He played in the centre. Yeah. He played it's in, in the back row. The women loved him. Yeah. He had all the sports ties. He played cricket. He swam. There weren't even a swimming pool at school, but apparently he was a swimmer as well <laughs> and played hockey. He was everything I wanted to be, yeah. but wasn't. And yeah, like we had some quality players. And I remember I got in with the, with a bad crowd at school or whatever. Like I grew up in a, in a shit area. Um, and then got invited to come up to Barker Butts. And that was the turning point, right. like spending time with, with you guys and you lads taking me out and yeah. open, opening my eyes up to what it was like to go out and get smashed but have a good time as opposed to fighting. Yeah. It's um, it's weird because it, like you're probably going through a bit of a shit time of that. I was as well, but you probably wouldn't have, weren't aware of it because I I blew my ACL at 16, motocrossing. I didn't play rugby for two years from 16, 17 to nineteen. So in that period, so I would have probably played a couple of games together. And you get sat in these meetings, not meetings, surgeons going, "Mate, you ain't playing rugby ever again. You're never going to do it." And they, people say that. Like a lot of the time, don't they? It's a bit of like, oh yeah, where is me? But they were genuine conversations at seventeen. So I think you, know, you come through it, and then it goes again, getting on the school bus, do another ACL, and I think, well, fuck, I'm never going to play rugby again. So I spent a lot of that period of time watching you play, uh, watching that Colts group, and I think I remember, I remember getting jealous of you. Uh, I was on crutches at Cowden Road, and you'd been playing for, you weren't playing, but England played there. England had. A it had been under 21s or 18s. I can't remember what it was. And I looked at you, and I'd been through like 18 months of like on crutches and whatever, and a pretty talented rugby player could go somewhere, whatever. Uh, I looked at you, and you had your England blazer on. And I couldn't look you in the eye. I felt like shit because of my injury. Mm-hmm. But it's like, is that like, like jealousy? It's like, what's that about? And it's probably a bit of age. And then sort of your, my knee came good, and then things ended up down at Sarri's and whatever. And it was, things went okay from there. But, that that period, like that, shaped I think a lot of like re- that reflection piece. I uh, I've never looked at it like I am now. It's weird, like you're saying that. I've looked reflect on other areas of my life because I've needed to, but that that period, I think it shaped my attitude towards my career because it had al- it almost gone, and that sort of it was like fuck it, I've got another chance here, and my other chance was go and fucking enjoy it because mm. I did not want to play rugby. I wanted to be trying to earn a career out of it. So um, it's that, that period of my life was, was tough. But what, in terms of watching you play, I don't know, it was, it was great because you grew, as in you, were, you, were, you grew into your body, I mean, as a human and, and, and as a rugby player. And I remember, I remember watching you think, fuck, yeah, there's something in him because you're aggressive and you, were, you had that bit of, see, yeah, bit of, yeah, bit of cunt. Bit of cunt in you. The bit you can't coach. Yeah. And that's in you, right? So if you're looking at players and, and that was in you. So if someone back to bang you on your nose, you bang them back, which is like I said, the bit you can't coach. And I'll kind of watch you grow a little bit more into understanding the game, whatever, because you've come into it quite late. And I think we played against you when you were in Nottingham on, on loan, and um, 
What's that ground called? I must forget the name of it. It's like the, the trees down the side, wasn't it? The fucking something acres, is it? Something like that. I used to hate playing there. And not, I remember Nottingham's ground. Yeah, Nottingham's ground. Was it Golden Acres. I don't know what it was, but I remember playing you, and then I was like, "Fucking hell, the guy can play rugby." Yeah? Humbly, yeah. I was bloody good. That's it. I don't know why. <laughs> that was me, arguably at my very best when I was at Nottingham. I think you like you rag, you ragged me across the floor. I was like, "Hey." I think I gave some of my worst shit chat. He's like, hey, we've got a scoreboard or some shit, and then you beat us. But yeah, and then it's like, ah, fair play, because you've obviously gone, learned your craft a bit. And it was also that time of my career when I was, I reckon I was 21, 22. It came down to opportunity, right? Yeah. So, and a lot of people will say, a lot of parents will say, right, I want my kid, I want my lad. Obviously, the women are playing more so now mm. as well, but I want my lad to play rugby. How does he become a professional rugby player? They'll say that to me. Yeah, having been a professional yeah. player, and I'll be like, the likelihood is they're not, for a number of reasons, which is tough for them to take, because it's everything. How much do I need to pay you to make a professional rugby player? Yeah, <laughs> you can't. But you you nailed it on the head there. Your pathway from where I was looking yeah. and the lads that we've just mentioned was to go and be a professional rugby player. You had the talent to do it, but mm. you wreck your knee. You're out for a year. You're out for two years. Yeah, and you're on the profile age spectrum of 16 to 18. Yeah which is the most important, even yeah. more so now. Yeah, definitely now. I didn't have that. So I came into rugby late Yeah, and didn't really play at the start, got picked up in a Warwickshire versus Leicestershire match, having a big fight in, in the game, ironically with a guy who went on to be my best man at my wedding, Brett Deacon. With, with Brett, not because like, Louis is a bit older, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, and got picked up, got picked up off that game. and For having a scrap. Having a scrap. Dino was there. Dean Richards uh, was there watching. Uh, and people don't know that about my career. They, they you know, some people... People so think it's a pathway, you know, you get into the age group stuff and you get picked up. Mine wasn't. I Mine was completely the back door. I worked behind the bar at Barker Butts. Yeah, I can remember. And got picked up that way. Three pints. Where I managed to make a career out of it, I was desperate. I had, right. I had nothing else. And I didn't realise until later on in my career and you listen to things and, again, you reflect and... You understand where you are in life in terms of getting a decent contract for the first time yeah. and what motivates you. My sole motivation as a young lad was to not be poor. Full right. stop. Leicester gave me my first big contract, 50 grand, and my performances, this was after I played for Nottingham, went downhill. And the reason was is because I felt like I'd made it, made it yeah. for the first time ever. And I remember going through, a, I remember sat with Dusty Hare and with Dean Richards and they were like, look, we're paying you a fortune now. Yeah, I mean, it was a fortune. Yeah, 50 grand, yeah. 50 grand is a lot of money. And my motivation levels weren't there. I'd gotten to the point of being able to go out on the piss, bought myself a car, financed the car. It was a Ford Focus. <laughs> the number plate was Y23TRY. <laughs> try. Uh, it was, I didn't buy I that. Gonna, yeah, yeah, TRY. Yeah, try. TRY, try. try. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... That is what drove me to be the player that I was. And that to that was, point. To that point. But then I, I think after as well, I think my, my, there, was a, there was a couple of stages. One was a desperation to do something. I didn't want yeah. to be poor. I didn't live on the streets, but I weren't fucking close. You know, I yeah. was close to living on the streets and the background and, and the life that I had. Yeah. I was never going to be a rugby player. And then all of a sudden, I'm a fucking rugby Chuck player. 50, 50 bags. Exactly. 50 bags, fucking car. And Happy days. Made it. I and where have you been at? 21, 22? I was 21, yeah. I, I think 20, 2021 is when I really... 21, it was my, my birthday, 21st birthday party when England won the World Cup in 2003. I remember I was at the Cov Colliery Club for my 21st birthday. We we played... Bed, I was at Cov playing for Cov then at Cowden Road, watched the final in the morning, couldn't go do anything. And then we played a game of rugby in the afternoon. It was the shittest game of rugby I think I've ever played in because everyone had watched it in the morning. It's weird, isn't it? But... You mentioned Cowden Road. Yeah. And my first memories, Did you, I don't know if you know this, I was a ball boy at Cov. Well, yeah. So I lived in Radford. Well, I was I was as well. So we, But I'd have been, because I'm a bit older, aren't I? So you ball boyed at Cov. Did you I, get 50p? <laughs> I, I used to get free hot dog and chips. Your dad was playing. Yeah. Aggie, the Aggie. hooker. Yeah, yeah. Grucock was playing a little bit, and they had a back row of copper called Dave Leverage. Yeah. He big fucker. Mate, fighting. Like yeah. you wouldn't believe. And I remember, you know, yeah, I've got the balls were slippy as anything. The it, was, it was, yeah, it was a mud, it was, yeah. it was a shithole. I yeah. remember, but that was, well, that is, so if, if you'd say to me, what's my first memories of rugby? It was watching your dad. That's 
weird because my first memories of watching my dad as well. Uh, <laughs> but it's weird. I grew up at that rugby club, so I started. Mum and dad, their best accident. Like they had me very young, uh, so I sort of they'd have been twenty at the time, um, and then just grew up at Cowden Road. Like if people say to me, "What what's your rugby club and where did you play youth rugby?" I, I skip out Elsdon and Barkers. It was Coventry because I was there ball boying, and all all my old man's mates would stay out with me at, and just play rugby with me on the field. Leave the leave the floodlights on for me, and all of that stuff. So that that place is like people say, "What's the favorite? What's your favorite ground of all time?" It's Cowden Road. And loved it but I had a different relationship with it because dad was playing here mm. you don't and also sort of looking at it you don't realise that when I was sort of 8, 9, 10 the old man's 30 32 you know, or you know a bit or tw- late 20s and you know fuck okay, I was a young bloke and he's still he had a 6am curfew you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> on a Sunday and I remember like you just wake up and he's like I'd go down the shop to get him some cherry aid and the news of the world and it's like all oh, like Steve Brain all these guys Aggie at some point and then I ended up my first season playing with guys that dad had played with and then you just get filled in because I'm son of yeah. <laughs> and they just want to fill you in and their nails and I'll tell you what there's a difference in your first professional contract so my first professional contract was with Coventry well, I used to I went to I was in Sarries like in the 21s they used to give me expenses when I was at uni about 180 quid or something a month and I signed at Cov me and the old man went in with his Graham Robbins who's called Godba I don't know who Godba he was sorting the contracts out and he's like, right, uh, we can do this for you. We can do that. We're going in. Yeah, I well, don't really know what I'm going to get here. And uh, he went, how about 400 quid a month? Put you in a bit of digs and give you a car. <laughs> oh, fuck, yeah. Where do I sign? <laughs> Bang, sign. And then didn't play for like the first part of the season, then got in. And then, and I couldn't have been happier. I don't, I've kind of nailed it. I've gone, right, I want to play for Coventry. That's all I want to do. And then my first contract's with Coventry. I go the hard way through getting beaten up by my old man's mates just to make sure I'm okay. My first season of rugby, £400 a month, a Peugeot 406, Zinzan Brooks playing in the team on a grander game. And I'm loving life. I think this is fucking brilliant. And it's, it's just like, I didn't think I'd made it. I just had an opportunity to, like I had a bit of some beer tokens, play with some people that I really, really like, wanted to play with, and have a fucking good Saturday night. Yeah. It was brilliant. And it was, it's was, it was weird. And there's, like after every Thursday training session, I'd be doing drop goals with Zin- Zinny from the halfway line and I'm still mates with him now. It's just like, and he was my hero as a rugby player, apart from the old man growing up. And he's there playing for Coventry at Cowden Road. It's mental. It's crazy. I remember Derek Eaves as well. Eaves, yeah. Loose, Cannon. Yeah. Cough were good, weren't they? Yeah. Like they're genuinely back. I'm trying to think when that would have been. 96, when, I think. Yeah, in the 80s they were good, weren't they? 90s. They, they were up and down a bit. And it was Mosley. Richmond were pretty good back then yeah. as well. They used to have the Boxing Day fixture, Cov Mosley, which was like huge, like thousands of people in there. You know, and that hey, the rugby they used to just kick lumps out of each other. But yeah, when Derek was there, Derek Eves, there was they bought a big contingent up from Bristol and they nearly made the Prem. They they lost to London Irish in a playoff final. And then it went tits up for a little while. Uh, when the money sort of just dried out because they didn't make that Prem Prem gap. But yeah, there were some good players. Because listening to your podcast and listening to Alex Ray, who's a Kovskin as well, yeah. and he's another player who probably wasn't quite big enough, I think, to go all the way. He yeah. obviously had a, a brilliant career, but he was another lad, a, yeah. a, a young lad coming through. I was like, this lad's quality. Yeah, He played quite a bit for Northampton. He did a bit he? of Saints. He's Bedford. Yeah, um, of course, Bedford. He was there for a while. He had a late gig at Wasps as well. Okay. Uh I love a football, like a what they call like a five and a half, isn't he? So, yeah, he was just he was just yeah, a, a, really gift, talented, yeah, yeah. a gifted player. But he kind of and yourself rolled off a few names that had come from Coventry. And the yeah. weirdest thing is, I suppose not weird, some big names. Yeah. Especially back in the day, not so much now. Yeah. And I think it's because living in Cov and the foundations your old man and these lads put in, yeah. we're hard. Yeah. I, whether or not that's through the water that we were drinking from the cold canal or what, I don't know. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? So you think like hit, hit, hit me with some names. So we got Neil Back, Backy, uh, Grucock, Rob Hardwick. Yeah, he played uh, prop for England. Uh, Leon Lloyd. Leon, yeah, I always feel about Leon. Boulders, Adam Bolden, hard as nails. Oh, mate, how hard is Boulders? Hard as nails. I played against nails, him, so mate. fifteen, sixteen. Like, I thought I could tackle him. Fuck me, that bloke just runs straight and hard. I was at school. So you, when I was at school. And I remember it was a, quite a diverse school. 
he's come in the sixth form, big puffer jacket, and he has wiped out everyone in the sixth form. He's got rid of really all the shit blokes, <laughs> wiped them out, and I remember him just sat there by the pool table, all the women around him are thinking, this guy is the fucking king. Yeah. Boulders. Oh, Boulders. What a bloke. Hard. I played with him at Worcester for a year. Fucking, I'd never really spent any time with him, but what a bloke. Yeah, mate, legend. Big polar bear. Mm. Mate, you're, uh, you're your best mate. Goody. Goody. He's yeah. not really from... He's Cod. not Cod, mate. He's... No, he went to Henry's. That's not Cod. No, it isn't, no. And, and he went Bromsgrove. to Bromsgrove, Bromsgrove was School. It? Yeah. Exactly. The thing about Goody is he... My nan lives on his mum and dad's road. So I've known Goody since we were tiny. Like, but I never really spent a great deal of time. But him and his brother, I played a cricket match with him once. But yeah, he's not really from Cov, is he? No, he's not, no. No. I'll tell you who is, who I live next door to, Tom Wood. Ah. Uh, I live I, next door to him. What so, you, you live in Edinburgh? No, when I was in Cov, <laughs> when I was a kid. I'm, I'm Scottish now, of course I live in Edinburgh. Authentic. I live three doors down from Tom Wood. Mates with his brother. His brother was an unbelievable Rob. rugby player. Rob, yeah, yeah he had a, he had a knee nasty, problems. Yeah, yeah, same knee issue that I had for about a year. Yeah. Um, but he couldn't get right. I think he's, he went into physio and stuff. But yeah, so Tom Wood, we're probably missing a few. Yeah, I've gone blank. There's, there is, they'll come, they'll come, but there is quite a few when you, because people say, oh, there's fucking so many of you cough lot around. But none of us got picked up by cough. No. Like, I, I'm trying to think if... if I'd any, have been yeah, one of the only ones that, but that's... Literally through, 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 your, through your old man. Trial at Bedford, and they said no, and I went to Cov, and obviously they said yes, on four hundred quid a month. <laughs> My car. And, oh, it's a Persia. They were sponsored by Persia, yeah. weren't they? But there was no. There's no pathway there, is there? It's uh, it's weird. There's a lot of less. I suppose we got Leicester and Worcester that would pick up the, the players now, but then you'd play Barker's first team, get picked up. Or you'd go Warwickshire, wouldn't you? Then go Broad mid- Street was quite big then, wasn't it? Yeah. Or it got bigger after. Yeah. Then you'd get like Midlands, wouldn't you? Mm. And then that's where you'd, you'd go off and do what you needed to do in yeah. your career. But it's, yeah, it's kind of a strange one. that they, they seem to miss a lot of players. There's a few back there now, I think. But Yeah, I've seen that. Are they are they investing back in the club there? I'm a Lewis Deacon. I'm best mates with his brother, Brett. I yeah. know he's coaching the women's he's, yeah. England team now. Alex Ray's gone back there. Yeah. So Alex is it's his first time there, so like he'd never have had anything to do with the club from a playing point of view. But he's gone back as as a cov, was he cov? He's forwards coach now. But in terms of investments, I worked there for a year in the community. It's it's got it's got a few more boys from cov in, in the team, so they've sort of tried to bring people in that understand the area, and I think that's important for for any club, not just Coventry. But it's got its core group of supporters and players. Uh, opportunity to build stadium and things but it's in, in that part of the world and that is not world that sphere of rugby it's difficult isn't it it's like there's not like build a stadium then what then where do you go I don't have an academy because Worcester have got it Worcester have got it like, where's your pathway it's very it's difficult to to build the club from ground up whereas you look at an Amptel uh, or a community club first and now sort of going into a championship sort of arena they have a pathway of players. And if it's one or two that make it great, but it then draws people into, into the first team, I think, it, you know, it's, but it is a difficult space for, for clubs to generate their own, own players just because of the academies just sweep everyone up. Yeah. We'll get onto that. Yeah. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to talk about. But yeah. yeah well, I went off on one there. No, 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 yeah. no, it's great because that's what I wanted yeah. to talk about was yeah. your career, but in the champ, I look at, where rugby is now and it's easy sitting here with 78,000 followers on Twitter having played at the level that I that was looking at I know I bought <laughs> half of them and th- 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 there is luck along the way we know we know right. there is there is like y- th- there is there absolutely is right place right time and I'm not saying that to, to downplay what I've done but I'm just saying I now sit here I don't know how with a little bit of a voice in rugby Yeah, where I look at the landscape of it and I can say what I want and people interact. You know, David Flatman can say what he wants. Lawrence yeah. Delalio, Austin Hilly. Not that I'm putting myself in the echelons with them. People with a following who've perceived to have done stuff in the game. I look at the lads that have played in the fucking championship, yeah. like yourself, yeah. as in that is proper rugby. Yeah, That is proper rugby. And there's no better people or players that are well-placed in the game to talk about the game yeah. Than the lads who have been at the well, yeah, yeah, season upon season, 
And that is why I want to talk to you. <laughs> because, I mean, you had a great career and yeah. you're a legend in the champ. Three, how many games? 300, is it? Something like that. I Just round it up to four. I what what is it? Is right. it around? I don't actually know. Let's go 350. It's not, but let's go around there. 350. <laughs> well, I mean, anything above 200, but it's 300 it's and something. Yeah, it's around, yeah, in the champs, around 300. I think. That is, yeah. that is... 21 operations. Let's... <laughs> that, well, you've given your body to the game, and when we met maybe three years ago when things were normal, I think yeah. your missus was playing for Saris. That's right. Against Quinns, and you were... I don't know whether I saw you or you told me about oh, detaching no. your biceps. I was like, where yeah. are your biceps gone? You were like, well, I've two golf balls. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, this needs to be out there in the open, both from <laughs> a, a joking standpoint, I felt better about myself and how small my arms were, but also in terms of, I'm going to say it, fucking sacrifice that these lads, like yourself in the championship, yeah. make. <clears throat> and I understand there's a big play for player welfare and concussion and aftercare yeah. and transition and all these things. But we're in a much better position to go through that. We've got doctors, yeah. we've got surgeons on call, we've got PDP managers, we've got psychologists. Oh, exactly. Player development. Yeah, I know. I oh, you being, know, you got me. You got me. <laughs> yeah, just being facetious. And There's a word for you. <laughs> we are, I'm not going to say moaning about it. I'm going to say bringing it to the spotlight, bring yeah. it to the fore. A lot of us have been paid well. Mm -hmm. six figures for years and years and years and years so there's an element of we're set up Yeah, I look at the championship and I say that having played in the championship but I've got so many mates yeah. good mates that have played in the championship and we're talking about fucking game after game after game after game going to the arse end of the world albeit lovely Cornish Pirates how far north can you go you've got uh, Doncaster Donny yeah, Donny's your furthest. Well, Donny, I mean, Donny leads. You, you say no more. You go Otley. To, Otley were in it for a bit. I nearly got drowned in Otley. So, <laughs> what, in I the bath know. after or on the pitch? No, on the pitch. This guy who was in the Marines nearly drowned me that year. And I was like, well, it's either now or never to make it professional because I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, do this. When you look back on it, was it tough? It's fucking brilliant. Yeah? Yeah. I know I know. you know it's brilliant. No, you, no. I, it's the, I'll tell you what. It's interesting when you... Like, my... I was embarrassed of playing in it. Like, so say if you're going to a conversation, not embarrassed about talking. So I still say it now. So at work, when I'm working, I'm chatting to people and they say, oh, I used to play rugby and it's a good story. And I, I always still open with, it's only level two. It was championship rugby. And then I had two years in the Prem. Actually, it was a year and three months in the Premiership. And I talk about talk about it like that, but, and, and I don't know why. And I, I think it's maybe because not pe many people are aware that you can play professional rugby in the... Uh, uh, level two as well in this country in terms of like going to the well and you know I think the the best decision I made from early I think mainly because of my knee I took out I always have medical insurance so I'd always always have that whether the club supported me or not it's something I always had so if something went wrong I could go and have an op and I, I knew that because mum worked in a ho in a private hospital so I, I I did that quite early so any sort of issues I had um I could I could go and have an op or or whatever, I could go and see the right person. Um, and I took responsibility for that because I, I I learned early. So, you know, uh, Mickey Curtis. So, Mickey Curtis is, oh man, what's his, Big John, isn't it? Big John, I always forget his name. But anyway, he was, George and John, who won the FA Cup. So, George Curtis and John Sillett. Right, got there. Right, so, I had a conversation with him when I signed my first contract. And we were laughing earlier about like 400 quid a month. And I said that to him and I found out people are on this and that. And he goes, mate, how did you feel when you signed that contract? I was over the moon. He said, well, forget everyone else. That contract was right for you. And that's kind of how I approached it from there. So, yeah, people earn more money. Uh, and yes, the championship, it's a grind, but it's fucking good fun. I, I, I used to really, like, I get frustrated with it. Like, you look back through rose-tinted glasses a little bit. But there's, there's times when you get frustrated with the coaching, you get frustrated with the boys you're with. Looking back at me, I bet I was fucking, but boys would get so frustrated with my attitude. I can see it. I was a little prick at times. And, you know, it's, but then you sort of grow and you grow into the group and like leadership groups within teams. Um, but it was, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an area that I am proud of, but it's also like, I don't, it's, there's no what ifs for me. I did everything I wanted to do and I did it quite early. Um, 
in, in my career as I'm playing for Coventry and I wore an English student shirt and then I was always chasing this premiership contract. Got it at twenty nine, made a debut at thirty for Worcester. Um so that like I, I look back and say, Yeah, fair play, you did all right. Um but it is I played in an era where the money was was all right. So like I think my highest paid contract in the champ would have been about thirty five grand. Um I, I flirted between twenty five and thirty five. And that was all right for me. And I, I always referred back to how did you feel when you signed a contract? And I'd never get annoyed at people earning more money than me because they deserve more money or someone thinks they do. And boys like yourself and b- b- boys in the Prem, I fucking know, how come he's earning that? He's just a tracksuit and blah, blah, blah. But he's, I- I'd have signed that contract. Who fucking wouldn't? Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, he should be playing in the champ and, you know, he's just a tracksuit in a premiership squad. And he's earning 80 grand a year. That's a fucking good tracksuit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody good tracksuit. Uh, but it's it's a good league. It's attritional. It's good fun. You could you could go and have a bit of, you know, you have some scraps in there. Um, I think because I moved around the clubs a lot, you got you met some like the network's very good, and you, you know, you just you just get to learn different characters, and it's good fun. I used to fucking hate going to some places, but then I I listened to some. This is where a lot of frustration comes with sort of some of the Prem boys and what they say about the championship. And it's the way, oh, you, you know, I, I forget who said it. Like, uh, well, you go down to Penzance and it's a shithole. And, but so was your junior rugby club growing up. Do you know what I mean? Like, when, when did it become this? I know the premiership's what it is and there's a load of cash in it. When, when did rugby players become that precious around... Their environment. Oh, that's been building for a while. Well, that's yeah. the new age of yeah. players. Like you're cut from, from yeah. Cov. Yeah, <laughs> the old school cloth. I mean, even I said the arse end of the yeah. country. Well, it is like well, Cornwall, is it, but as in it is a shit hole. But that's rugby. Yeah, is it not or was? Was yeah, and that's and that's the, that's the line I sit on. I like, I understand. Like if I've been to, if I've gone to Millfield, and I've been in a professional training environment from 13 to my professional rugby co- contract then I don't know any difference. So when I go on loan to Amptel and I go down to Pirates, I am going, fucking hell, what is this place? It's a shithole. And then, but if you've got someone else that's come from the, like my side of it, or is a bit more senior, so someone like Paves who's down at Pirates, well, this place is brilliant. It's character. It's mm. what, what great, you know, like if you, you come and spend a bit of time with us and you get that life experience and you understand that you have to wait to go into a gym session because you've only got one small area. And it's just that little bit of growth outside of that full professional athlete environment, which is what the championship gives you. But some of these boys are just just alien to it. I think it'd do them good just to see it. Well, it's interesting because when I was at Leicester and I got sent to Nottingham, not because I wasn't tough, tough enough, because Jono and Ben Kay were there. I probably wasn't <laughs> tough enough as well, and Lewis Deacon. <clears throat> what they used to say was, a bit soft him, you can't even say that now, a bit soft him, send, put him in the championship for a season. <laughs> That's what genuinely yeah, that yeah. is what that is what they did, and yeah. even even at Saracen, so even at the end of my career, yeah, they'd be like, right, young so, lad, especially in the forwards, the backs was a bit different, yeah, because they said, tend to be ready to go, don't they? Backs, well, they're days. quick, and they? I mean, once you're quick yeah. and you can pass, I mean, good looking, exactly. Because you ain't getting the ball as well in the champ, are you? Let's be yeah. honest, a little bit more now, but not then. Centers, that's it. So you've got a big twelve, get him in well, the Well, of champ. course, yeah. <laughs> you, you see all the lads that are from Samoa Tonga. Sam Tui Tuslo, is he still playing? Or not? He was at Cod for a bit, weren't he? Mate, I played against him when I was at Amp. Fuck, I was just staying wild. My though. goodness me. he came from nowhere. What a bloke. Well, I'm sure he was. But, uh, Off the pitch. Fun. Oh, mate. He played in that one for a year. He was killing people. He could win covering that one. Yeah. That was right. Fuck knows how they got his contract. Fuck knows what they're paying for. They maybe got him a Persia. <laughs> four or six. He's on four hundred quid a month. Maybe a, maybe a day. Oh, they, but, they just want to play code, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, um, mate. What a bloke to have in your team at that level. And, yeah. That's it. Trying to get the profile of the team. Like, how do you become a good championship team? Do you need a shitload of money? Because we're seeing now with Ealing, Ealing, Ealing. Who else has got a bit of money in the champ? Cornish Pirates. There was talk of them building a stadium and still going that. Well, I signed in 2006, and that was part of the, was the reason for signing. <laughs> Soldier the dream. <laughs> yeah. You're going to play Prem Rugby. Right. The old five-year plan. Fucking 15 years later. But I think that's actually moving. What do you need to cash? Definitely. but Cash in terms of what players or squad depth? Well, I, you talk about Ealing, and I we spoke to Ben Ward on, on our pod 
and I look at from the outside being a champ player and you think, oh, they just, what they do is they, all the best players in the champ, they lift them and take them to Ely. What the fuck are they doing? You know, it's what sort of clubs are going to be high turnover players. It's actually settled down and what they've built off the field is a fully operational, ready to go into a premiership facility. Now, they don't have any support base, so there's their issue. Um, do they, I think, can they go into the premiership and do okay? I don't know. It's going to be tough for them to finish one one above whoever's bottom. That would be a result for them. Uh, I think geographically you need to look at what what opportunity there is. But there are, there is, I think there's six. So you've, in, the, in the champ, you've got um, Ealing a full-time, Jersey a full-time, um, Pirates, Doncaster. Who else have we got? Hartbury are pretty much full time. They they do like a seven till nine shift in the morning, and then they all go off to work and then come back. Uh, that's full time rugby. I was going to say, is that full time <laughs> or what? I don't know. I've got um, I've got my blinks. So, and when you say full time, Coventry as well. How much are they getting? Let's just lay some figures out there. I don't know what the average salary uh, in the Prem is now, but I mean it was around sixty to eighty grand. Yeah, and so, then we know that there's million pound players in that. Yeah, in that echelon now. What's the chance? I think we. I don't know about Ealing, so they, they'll they'll be above everybody else. So I I don't know numbers exactly, but if you're so the profile's different for clubs like say Doncaster. So Donny is a cheaper place to live. Their profile of players will be up to 25. They're reduced because they've reduced their wage bill because they've had to. Right, so I need that guy that's been dropped out of a Prem club who's still hungry to play Premiership rugby. So their profile of player is that and they'll be getting between 15 and 25 grand a year. 15 and 25? For a full time. And I think they'll probably have a couple that are in their 30s, but that's the sort of money you're talking. Pirates would be very similar. Because geographically, again, it's... What's this geographical stuff? Is that because it's cheaper to live there and they'll use that and leverage that and be like, right, okay, so it's not, no. it's not a London club, it's not a London Scottish. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. so your, your cost of living's cheaper. So you can offer... Yeah, a, but you're the same player, are you not? <laughs> I don't and, know. Yeah, that, but it's, that's how they have to work. Because if I'm, if I'm 29 and Doncaster offer me 25 grand, I'm going to say no. Bedford could offer me 25 grand and a, and a job, I'm going to say yes, because I'm going to earn 45 grand. So like the, the, the Bedford model would be completely different to a Donny model because they can operate similar money to Donny. But Donny, oh, you can just go and chase the dream at Donny because you're a full-time rugby player. And, the, and, and there's that kudos attached to it, isn't it? And that also that opportunity to go and potentially bounce into a premiership contract, which happens all the time. We are so, seeing that more and more. Yeah. Um, who are the headline ones recently? I know Mark Atkinson got capped by England. Do you know Aki? I don't know Aki, but I, I feel like I should. Yeah. He seems like a legendary bro. Yeah, he was at Bedford, world's most sarcastic man. Love him. Really? He's a fucking good bloke. He'd, but, be great, he'd be great on a podcast, wouldn't he? Yeah. I think yeah. he was doing a podcast for Gloucester. But, yeah, he was doing the Gloucester one. Yeah, he came on ours, actually. He was good. Um, Aki's a big one, just been cap- Nick Dolly. Yeah. Uh, playing champ rugby eight months ago. He looks like a champ player, doesn't he? he like, does. as in, if you were to profile <laughs> a championship hooker, Nick Dolly. Yeah, he's That's it. it. But there's loads, mate. This is the thing about it. Like, we chat. Like we speak positively about it, and it's it's no surprise when what happens to Aki or what happens to Nick Dolly happens. It, it's like the, the thing is, it's like who else would like Tom Youngs did it years ago, didn't he? He was at Nottingham. He was centre. He was yeah. then moved to hooker. Yeah. So young Ali Price. These these Bedford. boys. Bedford. Bedford. There's, there's loads. And it's, I know my champ. Tom Thomas Francis. Who was he? Was he Donny London Scottish? Was he Donny? Yeah. Mate, bag of sick. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it didn't surprise me. That's sorry, Tom, but he was he was uh, big you, though, big man. Oh, huge man! What a career! I took three years in the champ. But that's it. It's, it's when you're big, like that's yeah, it. I, yeah. I know I'm stating the obvious. Yeah, but you're big, and then there's big, big, and he's yeah, big, big, he's big, big. So. And they throw them into the champ. Why is it so? Why? What? Why is it such a good apprenticeship? In, and I say that, and I don't mean to sound derogatory. No, no, it's, I, I, yeah, I'm, because obviously we, like you've said it there, but like the everyone wants to be a professional rugby player who's probably yeah. playing in the champ. I don't yeah. imagine they're thinking, right, let's stay in Donny. I'm sure, it's a lovely spot, Sheffield. That's where you go out there. You when you're at Donny. <laughs> Fuck knows, I don't get. A, and just to play drop in, drop out. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is to play prem. Yeah. So well, I chased it hard for. That's why I moved clubs. I was like, "Fuck, I, I want to play Premiership rugby. I'm, I'm being paid to be a full time rugby player." And then at 29, phone call comes in and you're on loan to Leicester. Right. Yeah, I've fucking done it at 29. And you, you make your debut at 
nearly 30. Were you Leicester or Worcester? I had three months at Leicester. Did you? Yeah. So I, got, I was thinking through the archives and I had a... Uh, so I went, it was the start of 2011, I think, and I got a call off my agent saying, oh, Leicester need a, a lock. Uh, Parlin's injured. Beeks was injured. And then Cockers was like, yeah, if Cockers played with Dad. Yeah. So, and I was... He, he didn't even need to see you play. He's like, he's yeah. a Gulliver, we'll get him in. Yeah, and up I went. Um, I had three months up there. Um, I had the opportunity to stay, but my agent or whoever fucked it up for the end of the season. So I went back to Pirates. We got to the champ final that year. Um, and then I was signed for Worcester the year after. I was playing. I'd, I'd signed at Worcester. And I, had, I was in contract at Pirates in the middle of a two-year. Like, what the fuck's that about? So we then make the final. And I'm sitting there going, oh, it doesn't really matter who wins this. But wanting to play, obviously. And then the coaches pulled me out saying, look, you can't play because we're going to put you in a situation that if you were to drop a ball or if you were to do this, it's, you just, oh. just just don't do it. And yeah. I was like, yeah, fair. But looking back, it's like, yeah, fair play. That's That was the right call. But at the time, it's like, oh, you're questioning my integrity. You're doing this. You're doing that. But yeah, that was at that was at thirty. So I had a year at Worcester. With, that's when I met Goody properly for the year, which is uh, until he was in, at the realm, and it wasn't what I thought he'd be. Prem rugby. Yeah, so Worcester, Worcester's a t- it was always a tough club, wasn't it? He had a load of rock stars. Yeah. Well, I say rock stars, probably on the on the pay payroll yeah. in terms of paid rock, rock, rock stars, rock star money, yeah, and cars. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, but the, the Leicester bit was was great. It was I was up a little bit like, what's it going to be like? Uh, Cockers was great I can get over how good Cockers was his detail and, and all that And again old school yeah golly. now you speak to it's the, the socks thing isn't it <laughs> down socks down <laughs> no you can't go in the gym with gym socks you have to wear rugby socks oh, yeah could, well, that, that as well oh, down right. you can't pull them up in the gym I don't know what it was fucking weird I liked it though but you can't do that now no uh, especially at Edinburgh they, they weren't having it but they're not but, well he basically got ran out I think because he was too hard on them because it has changed yeah in terms of not just in rugby life but, yeah I don't want to say life softer but it it does seem softer maybe that's for the better yeah we just I think people are a little bit more aware of people's feelings feelings James. feelings could you James never called yeah James. but that, that, that's when you get to the feelings Benjamin yeah. we, start, <laughs> we start going f- full barrel name yeah but I want to talk a little bit more about the champ yeah in terms of the dark part of it and if there is a dark part of I've it been there, yeah. player welfare does it does it even exist or is it a kind of token we think that or we know that we think it's the right thing to do am I, am I, my my statement my statement and my comment being it takes money it takes funding now we know the champ is grossly underfunded mm-hmm. I've heard you speak about it you can see that you can see not that there's a token gesture from headline sponsors but there's a lack of investment and we don't know where the investment's coming from. Is it the RFU? Is it the owners? Yeah. Is it commercial sponsors? Is it the clubs? Is it the clubs that align with them? Yeah. You'll know more about it than me, but where I'm looking, it seems like it's underfunded. So therefore, the player welfare aspect, which is probably the most important aspect, gets yeah. thrown to the side of it. If you're running a championship club, your priority should be sustainability right? as a business. So that's priority number one. Then it's your squad. And then it's your match day. Match day, isn't it? To be honest, when I was in it, that was it. That was that was that was the all the priorities of the club. You have that, I suppose, that level within the the local community and what you can give back to that. But in terms of as a player, it's it's on it's on you, Jack. Do you know what I mean? So like, if you you know, I've talked about dark times and I look at my career and I joke earlier. Like I had, I, 21 operations. I had I had a lot of injury. And 21 operations. operations. Yeah, knees, ankles, neck, shoulder. All through my majority of it through, not the majority, say half and half, my, my, my insurance and said club that I was at at the time. And I look back and I, I if I got injured, I remember doing my knee at Plymouth and I paid for my scan because the scan wasn't coming quick enough. I was like, fuck, this thing needs, I need a scan on this. It's fine. So, so, so talk me through that process then. So you wreck your knee. Play so, for, I, so for, I play for Plymouth against Per Temps Bees, right? Real thriller at Albion. Jackal for the ball. I was 24 at the time. Oh, you were keen. Yeah. Nimble. <laughs> yeah. Last time I jackaled that was at 24. And after that, so I blew my MCL. Um, 
and they don't operate on them now. But at the time, I was like, this is fucked. So Wobbly. I, oh, it's awful. And the pain is horrendous. So I'm like, I know I need a scan. So I, I argue, you don't need a scan, you don't need a scan, because they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> of course. It's like, and I used to say, what would they do at Man United? They'd scan it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Similar. Yeah. But that's my, it's like, it needs a scan. Well, you're a person, you're a player, yeah. you're an athlete. Yeah, I need a scan on that. So I scanned it, fully gone, under the knife a couple of days later. The worst operation I think I've ever. It was a success, but after mate, the bladder stopped working. What do, what, what do you mean the bladder? So I'm sat there going, I need a piss, and I'm like lying there. And my pain threshold for the I was under for four and a half hours because I have to like sew it together. That's why they don't do the operation anymore. And um, so I was in there for four and a half hours. Came out pain. What's your pain? Nine. And I was there for like eight eight, eight hours overnight. Go through one saline drip another my stomach's going like something. I can't piss I can't piss I'm like, what, what do you need to do like, how, how do I stop this well we need to put a catheter in you Mr Gulliver what while I'm awake and they're like yeah I'm like I can't do that and through what orifice through your japs through the old boy <laughs> <laughs> I sat there going I can't do this like genuinely like but my stomach's going I'm just in all this all pain in my knee my stomach's fucked I'm like ah, okay right so I just ring the bell four in the morning you got to do it so pillow over my face. The old boy is like match day cock. It's the yeah, smallest. Got, yeah. yeah, it's you've never Dehydrated. seen it. It's like acorn, you know, <laughs> flush everywhere. And it goes, mate, violated. And this is not me being like as to embellish the story, but it didn't work. So she had to pull it out and do put another one in. Sweet Mary. So yeah, I'm glad I had that scan. <laughs> but that that was that was shit. But then I think like when I got injured, because I got injured a lot, and there's, there'll be people that think, oh, it's because I went on the piss a fair bit, but they were always like, they were big ones. They weren't, like, how do you stop your knee going under yourself in a jackal? I, know, I don't know, like, strength-wise, it was whatever. So I got unlucky with injuries. Yours were contact, contact injuries, yeah. like blown out, so stuff blew yeah, out. Stuff blew out, or repetitive injuries like a neck or a, a, you know, a, a shoulder injury. I used to get a few hammers in pre-season, but, I didn't want to do pre-season, so that's why I used to get there. Well, it's a great excuse, <laughs> isn't it? I'm going to get yeah. if I do this pre-season, there's a, a chance I'm going to probably rupture my hamstring off the bone. So <laughs> yeah, it's thing. up to you, <laughs> especially for low on players and I'm your best player. Yeah. Um, where were we? Um, injuries. So the, yeah, so the dark time. So I remember doing that, and and that's when you realise you're on your own, and it's uh, and there's just literally no support. So, and I don't even know if I wanted support, but it was just like you're dark and. Mate, I, I remember I, 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 hit the, I went on the piss really, really hard for like 14 days. That would have healed it. Yeah, I was, it was pretty much recovered. <laughs> but I'd lost it. I got a check through for insurance, from an insurance company. And my headspace was just, I just didn't know where I was at. I was like, right, I'm going to go on a, a UK tour. I'm going to go on the piss for as long as I can. And I look back and like, people must have seen me doing that. Nobody reined me in. Nobody said anything to me. No one was like, "Gully, you need to do it." I'd, if they'd have said it, I don't know if I'd have stopped anyway because I was I was just in self destruct. Now, if there's player welfare or a support network within said in the championship or at Prem, you can see those signs and it's like, "Well, oh, fuck, he's he's had that injury, he's had this injury." That's my third operation that year, and like, I was mentally shot. Um, just just wanted to implode and I did pretty successfully but then sort of you come out the other end and he gets a bit better move clubs and I was alright but I don't know I, I, it's weird like, like I was very as an individual I was very much an individual but I was also very team oriented so I love being in a team but I'd like being an individual so it's where um, if I look back away I'd have probably rubbed people up the wrong way through my attitude because it maybe sort of come across sometimes that I don't care but I, but I did care the person I didn't care about was myself. Mm. And that's, you know, that's like, you're looking at, you go, fuck, what, why didn't I, why didn't I look after myself a bit better? It's just, did I need someone, could someone have reined me in? Well, that's the support, isn't it? That's yeah. having a coach like myself. It was a Richard Cocker or a Dean yeah. Richards, having someone that, Somebody, e even if they ask you to rein you in, if they, if they ask you and you don't listen, then they tell you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think, and I think it's that level of respect, isn't it? Mm. That, or, and respect for, respect for the cause as well. So, it, yeah. so my point being, right, so if you're at Leicester Tigers yeah. 
and you're in G and E. And I remember I nearly lost my eye in a game playing against Borgwan. Went for a tackle, me and Castro Giovanni. Um, his finger's gone knuckle deep in the back of my eye, tore my eyelid, um, 20 stitches to reconstruct the eyelid after I went out on the piss in Borgwan and got on a flight back. Similar kind of thing because it's, it's, it's in us, isn't it? Like mining your characters of where we come from and yeah. the kind of journey that we had. Yeah. What is that old school mentality is like when the shit hits the fan, go out on the smash, go back to the mates and stuff like that. Yeah, just go and get pissed. It's weird, isn't it? But then I was at a club where, at Leicester, where, all right, they understood that there was a part of that. Yeah. But then you have that support network from a professional environment and yeah. an outfit that they've seen it all before. So they've seen it, they've been through it, and they also understand how to manage men. Yeah. And young lads... Yeah. All different spectrums and understand that you've got a Martin Johnson, one of the best yeah. captains in the world, and Never, you've got, yeah. you know, Stephen Booth, rest in peace, loose as a cannon. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you, you've got to be able to manage that. But in the champ, that's your story. Yeah. And there's going to be a load more others in terms of the pressures of these lads wanting to make it. I don't want to be horrible. 25 grand a year to play professionally yeah. is not a lot of money. Whether or not you live in Doncaster, you live in Coventry, or yeah. you live on a bloody farm in Cornwall or a caravan like Pete Cook my former England <laughs> prop cookie he played at I played at um, he was at Pirates when I first went lived in a caravan yeah lived in a caravan in Cornwall uh, cheap that's why probably the same caravan <laughs> same bloke <laughs> he used to go road kill apparently <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly what he used to do fuck he, so he had the same nickname everywhere he went then. Well, it was roadkill, wasn't it? Well, yeah. it was that, that was it. He yeah. couldn't afford to eat. Well he, well, he said he couldn't afford to eat. He'd drive around the, <laughs> around the back roads of the A <laughs> roads of Cornwall. Oh, mate. Dan Cole pickled him in a scrum once, playing for Nottingham. I was behind Cookie in a scrum. And Coley, and in the air, took him over from the 22. <laughs> really? <laughs> Finger in the air. That's when I, you know you've been hosed. Mate, I ejected out of that. Pretty yeah, quick. it's your fault, man. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's your <laughs> fault. So, fuck this. I'm out of here. Cookie, he was good when we were younger as well. Yeah. Another good player from Cobb, actually. Yeah, the, but the, the welfare side of it, yeah, it's. I don't know. I, there's a couple of bits. I don't. I'm not one for regrets. I, I don't look at it like that. But there's certain. There's 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 a time at, at Pirates where I was on. They fucking put a traffic light system on for drinking. And uh, what green means go, red means stop. Yeah, amber means three or four. Oh, okay. So just loosen you up a bit. So yeah, I'm, yeah. On, I'm on an amber. Three or four hit the lips. <laughs> <laughs> All you're seeing is green. I'm going, oh, I'm green lights now. And then, every, I think... Well, that's like, their fault then. You yeah. can't put a traffic light system on no. a and Ben then, Gulliver, can you, in his prime? <laughs> no, and then like, the fine system at the time was like a, a tenner for everyone else, but not for you. Oh, that, that the old heartstrings oh, one. Man. The old SAS, yeah. who's dares wins thing. Yeah, yeah. You'll do the press-ups, I don't think not they me. ever paid, but then I, I had no like sort of thought process about other people's lives at that point so people with kids people with that and I just you know it's, it's a it's a selfish act from the wrong almost from the right place but I don't know it was weird like why I did it it was nothing to do I wasn't thinking about anyone you're else. building the culture yeah that's what it, and then I look back and go, fuck all those guys had to pay a tenner just because I went on a piss I don't think they ever did but it was uh, not great but like in terms of like now I, I know I know Tom Cowan Dickey's a character at Pirates and he's he's got that element of like he can, he can go off the rails a little bit but he's well managed at, at Pirates by 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 Paves and, and Cats because they understand the character and I think that's where the game's changed it's like understanding if you understand people are different and they need a blowout or they need an arm round and when they're injured those sorts of things I think people are a lot more aware of that just in life but I, d I don't know what support's like in the Prem compared to the Champions I imagine it's a lot more but again you've got to want that support or the of trust in the system to give you it. Yeah, well, the big thing now is the support around concussion. You went to the doctors... Because I was worried. Okay. Because I... <laughs> my first game of men's rugby was for Coventry against Leicester at Leicester, second team game. I throw a shit punch left. Garf, Darren Garforth knocks me clean out, wake up on the sideline. Head. So that's my only knockout, really, I remember. Then I, I was one of those guys that had lots of c concussions. We'd fake the tests so we could so we could play. What was that test called that we used to do? It's the, it's the cards one, wasn't it? Yeah, cog, cog test. Cog, yeah, the cognitive test. We flip the cards if you've got to press. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah left, and then the right. red and black, and yeah, when the, you see a red card, hit Y, Y, have, yeah, X for black. You'd have a baseline, wouldn't you? Well, it's meant to be a baseline, but we'd always do it slowly in the baseline yeah. in pre-season, knowing 
Yeah. That there was going to come a time in the season where you were going to get concussed or have symptoms. And if you went slow in the test, it wouldn't pick up. Well, you could, if you were slower when you were concussed, you're right. There you go. Yeah. I, we all did it. Mm, we did. Yeah. All of us did it. And the motivations were that for wanting to play and wanting to earn 200 quid a game. That's why I did it. Uh, and one, and it's, but my, so I, I, one of those like people that would have the brain shake and like, I'd get like the head, I'd never go out. It stings. Uh, and I'd feel like this pain and you know, like, it, which is concussion, isn't it? I now know it's concussion. I just always fucking bang on the head. Uh, so the stories have started coming out lately. I've no dementia and the CTE stuff. And I was like, fuck. So I sent them, uh, an e-consult to the doctor. Just said, oh, sorry, it's not going anywhere bad, mate, by the way. No, 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 <laughs> no. no, please. Yeah, yeah. no, no. So, go, go, go. Yeah, so it's like, I, I um, send like a, quite a long email into the e-consult and just say, oh, what's, this is my situation. I feel like I've had lots of concussions over period of 15 years can you uh can you come see me so yeah I had, some, I had my blood test taken and I went back and saw him last week and it was all clear everything's fine and I was like fuck for that but it was a genuine worry and I don't know if, I mean how accurate can those things be but it was a weight off my shoulders because I was, I was thinking quite a bit about it I think mm. I just for, for peace of mind because there's there certain things and like behaviours that you do when you retire and you think, fuck, is this because I've had bangs on the head? Or, is or this... because I've retired and I'm struggling with transition. Yeah, or I'm a dickhead. Mm. And there's, there's that element as well. There's the character. Of course, yeah. yeah you know, you, you can make you can make a, a bad decision. It can be a bad decision. And you, there's no reason for it. It's not because you got a bang on the head. It's but you just... can blame something, can't you? Yeah, and that's the thing. And I don't know if I was looking for an excuse for some of my behaviour maybe, but... It's now knowing actually now I'm, I'm, I'm all right and the decisions I've made are just just life decisions that sometimes are right and sometimes are wrong. And I think it was that validation I needed that actually, yeah, uh, I'm all right. And you, you learn from those mistakes and you, you, you crack on a bit. Well, that's the worry. Yeah. Because, you know, chatting to Kelly Brown and a few other people, whatever level, and I've heard it again, reverting back to your podcast, you talk about transition a lot. Yeah, yeah. Is whether or not you, you're a World Cup winner, and I could be that could be harder because of the highs of the high, yeah. the highest of the highs. And if you're a middle-of-the-road player, and I was probably just above that in terms of experiences, mm. that you're never going to get to them heights again. You're never going to feel no. them feelings again. So the transition bit, I think, regardless, my point being whether or not you've won a World Cup or whether you're playing up at Donny, yeah. Cornish Pirates, and you're on the bus on the way home having just won that feeling of euphoria and that feeling of teamship and the feeling of validation that you're part of something, yeah, it's completely gone. It's the gone. taps are turned off. So I don't think it matters at any level. No. And I agree with you. I think even my retirement, when you have time on your hands to think by yourself, I start thinking, oh, I feel a bit off today. Yeah. Oh, I've got a bit of a headache. I probably <laughs> had a headache or I probably felt a bit off or I felt yeah. a bit demotivated or my serotonin levels were lower than they might have been the day before. Yeah, yeah. And all this stuff comes out and I start second guessing myself. Like I've Cause been, you don't, it's things you don't think about when you're in, in that group. We don't really have time either, no. do you? It's just like you're in no. it, you, you've got a game of rugby, you know, you're your knee, you're rehabbing. Yeah. You just crack on. Don't yeah. You? you just carry on. But then I think with everything that comes out and then you're no longer a rugby player and you start seeing the worst in the sport. I think there's an element that we all go through that of resentment. I went oh, through that when I finished. It. Yeah. And then you come back to and be like, actually, yeah. It's a fantastic sport, everything that's given you. But I think we all go through that in yeah. terms of everyone thinks that they're underpaid. I think reg- unless yeah. you're a million pound player, yeah. when you look at what other players are getting, you look at what you do. Yeah. And this comes back to the championship. I think the players are grossly, grossly underpaid. Yeah. I don't know how you can play a game every week, a contact sport, in the shadows and get paid 25 grand a year. I, I, I just, it, professionally. Yeah. It's, it's less in some places as well. It's. Uh, I think. It, and the thing is as well. I think it's negligent. I'll be honest. In terms of whoever is making them, I don't know. Sorry, I know it's not the clubs. No. Even though they are making the decision, the decision uh, even though I know they're making the decisions, mm. they don't have any money because no. it's not funded. Is there are a few not funding it or not? There are a few where they do fund it. Um, numbers. I think it's. So it was around six fifty per club per year, six hundred fifty grand. And is that just for the players, or is that that's for the? 
it's to be used as as you want. So for players, support staff, etc. And then, then the clubs will do what they want with that. Now that got stripped just before COVID uh, from 650 to I think it's 180, no, 80 grand per club per year uh, based on, um, what was it based on? Five key areas that the club should have hit. So sort of player pathway, referee pathway, community engagement. And there's, there's two others. I always forget the other two. Anyway, these five standards were dropped onto the championship club's table two days before the funding was cut by Bill Sweeney. So, and then it, I think the problem was that they didn't know it was coming and they just stripped all the funding out of it for these reasons. No, no England, like, there's no pathway for players. There's no value to the English national team. And that's, that was the view of the RFU. Now, there was, there was an option a couple of years before for the clubs that could have taken what had been between 600 and 1 million per year Forgive me if I'm wrong on that, but there was a, there was a good contract where the relegation would be closed for a little while, and then they could go and apply. The clubs that was on the table, and they said no to that. So, and then as a result, through COVID and everything, now it's all gone tits up, and they're getting nothing per year. So it's they have it's, it's self funding rugby clubs now, uh, and the disparity comes with a with a, with an amp, an amp tool that are part time uh, to a uh, Ealing that are full full time. To the, you know their their Premiership standard off field facilities, and that's where you get, you get like player welfare and the guys that when I was at Amtel I was getting I don't know I was working as well not and then it was like five hundred quid a month a couple of hundred quid a game something like that um, playing against guys that are on eighty ninety grand a year it's mental even at Bedford when I was at Bedford we played when Bristol were in the league when. Uh, and Andy Robinson was at charge, yeah. And they had the 200 club, didn't they? There was a load of them on 200k. Mm. We were all <laughs> fucking around on like On 20. the fags at the weekend night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, a, what a gig. What a gig for them. But they're playing against guys that are, some of them will be getting paid 200 quid a game. How the hell they didn't get promoted? Well, no, Al. They had Andy Robinson at the helm. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've never come across him. Is he yeah. Like? No, he's, he's, he's not the best, no. 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 Proof's in the pudding, is it not? Yeah. He, he won a World Cup, though, he'll say. <laughs> On his own, yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's so it's so loaded. What to do with the championship and how it how it comes out of it? What is what is right? What is good? The products the products pretty good. It was very good. You know, it's I think I think if it's shot in the right way, if it's filmed in the right way, and the stories are told, then I think there's an opportunity there commercially. Um, what do you think needs to happen? What would you do? So if you're calling out to the millions of listeners. And someone's listening that's high up in the tree of decision makers. Yeah. It's like politics. I don't think they can do anything. They'll just no. talk a good game and wait for a four-year cycle or a 12-year cycle, which we've heard before some of the yeah. discussions with World Rugby, who don't make decisions. They're no. just a governing body. Yeah, We don't know who makes decisions. I'm hearing EPCR are, are big decision makers when it comes really? to rugby um, in the UK. Yeah. What does it need? It needs money, right? It needs funding. It needs, but it all, the, the clubs within the league need to be have a business plan that's safe and which is profitable or at least sustainable. You could argue that in the Premiership as well because that's that's not, is it? That's massively upside down. Mm. If the champ could have that, and then you have investment similar to what they had from the RFU, that would be amazing because I think now they've had it taken away. I think the clubs would be smarter with that, and then an, an ability to for a free to air or a. I think if it went pay on a paid platform I don't think people would watch it but I think if it was on a, on a free to air channel then I think that would generate interest and that generates a commercial opportunity but the, the, the actual championship needs to have control of its commercial entity which it doesn't the RFU have control of that so the Green King sponsorship is very much a Twickenham deal and put the name and rights to the championship. So it just filters down. So it's almost like a box, not, not a box ticking exercise, yeah. but commercially it's like, right, okay, you give us a million pound well, and we will allocate X amount to the to that, but we want those pouring rights. And what a deal for Green King. Of course. You get the um, pouring rights at the stadium. Yeah, exactly. And then the championship is, there's no, there's no thought process of, we could go at Green King there. and Well, I think I've met someone at Green King mm. at the Oval watching the cricket, didn't see any of the cricket. And I think one of the statements that I heard made that day was they're not interested in the championship. Yeah, they're not. It's about pouring beer. 
and which if, is fine for them, of course. But, but if you're Green King and there's no visibility, yeah. What well, what's the point? And so unless you're going to a game, and my point being, what you've just made there, yeah. the fact that it's not on TV, is it on YouTube. Like, how would I watch a game? How would I watch Cov Amtel? Couldn't. Mental. Yeah, you could last year through COVID. There was a there was a streaming platform. It was a ten hour ago, I think. I think the numbers are okay, but then it's but it was COVID, so people were helping support the club by paying their, of paying their fee. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah because it's I don't know. I, I I COVID. I've sort of looked at numbers of what what how many people watch sort of Championship rugby over a weekend live, and you're probably between fifty. 15, well, probably 15,000 people live. So the audience is small, right? Um, if you look in the Premiership, it's probably 100,000 per weekend. That's small if you look at a football. So it's course. fucking tiny. We we think we're in this different world where mm. rugby's everything and everything. That's so true. Um, and it's not, it doesn't really, in the big grand scheme of things, I'm a big social entity, company, whatever, looking at those figures going, fuck, you know, why do I want to put money in that? Why would you invest? Yeah. But then... You know, if you look at the women's game and how that's marketing themselves now, you're thinking, fuck, there's definitely opportunity in there because they're, they're showing a different side to rugby and their audience is different. And I think there's an opportunity within the championship where the audience is different, it's more raw, uh, it's less polished. If you go to, I don't know, you, you, you take the right, say Jim Hamilton goes to, to Bedford and you meet Mike Greer, who's been there for 15 years, you do a pre-match interview with him, you hear his story, his day, his week. That's stole, told in the build-up to a game. Oh, fucking hell, that's that's amazing. And then, you know, again, the game, the game's the game. People enjoy it, and then you might just get a bit more interest. I was just trying to think outside the box. Yeah, of course. Well, that's the content play, yeah. isn't it? The and co- that's, yeah, content and, and yeah. chatting on a podcast and yeah, trying to get an insight. Oh, actually, I heard this. I saw this. Mm. You know, you're picking little bits out that mm. show the interest. Uh, you mentioned the women's game. Mm-hmm. Let's have a. I feel like it's a token gesture. It's not. A token gesture, but you're well across that yeah. in terms of in your house, yes. your well, girlfriend. She, you're not even married yet, are you? It's, it's ten years. Next ten year. years married. Of course you are. Just missed the <laughs> wedding. Just wasn't invited <laughs> no, to the wedding. So no. Georgie, ten Georgie. years married. Congratulations. I've never even said congratulations. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, James is <laughs> well embedded yes. in the women's game. So she was scrum half for Saracens, Saracens for yeah. how many years? Five years at Saris. Uh, she got 37 caps. And she played at Litchfield and Bristol. There you go. So well embedded in yeah. women's rugby. Where is this space? Uh, I'm trying to work it out. And I don't talk about it that much. And some people come at me and say silence is complicit and all yeah. this stuff around other things. I've got three girls in my house. I've got my wife. I've got my daughter, Phoebe. And I've got a, another daughter called Freya. Silence you, ain't, you remembered them? I slowly paused, yeah. <laughs> the boys I can speed through. I'm all for empowering women. Yeah. All for it. You know, there's not any part of me that is old school and being like, actually, women shouldn't be doing this. You know, it's a man's game. But I think maybe deep down, there could be something inside myself. But also a lot of the listeners would be like, why should the women's game get the amount of funding or the amount of profile that you've just mentioned there yeah. because it really is now yeah. and I think there's a big play not just in rugby globally for empowering women in business yeah. we've seen football how I mean naturally of course but how quickly that's accelerated John Beatty, one of my friends his sister Jen I think she's at Man City or Arsenal oh, right. or she's been at both and I've seen the acceleration in football mm-hmm. rugby there seems to be an acceleration yeah What's it like living in a house with a fellow rugby player? And does she feel like she's battling or they're pushing uphill to try and get people to take notice? Is there a viable commercial opportunity in, in women's rugby, how it looks in 15s? I th- I've been on the j- journey. Fucking journey. Everyone talks about Everyone's, this. Hey, we're all on a journey. <laughs> on this journey. But so I, when I first, so me and George first met, we... I'd always had an interest in women's rugby, but didn't understand it. Um, and then found myself sort of going to a lot of games, watching a lot of games. When, when Maggie was sort of in a pump and I'd be watching Georgie, I was like, fuck it, no, this is outstanding. Right. And the way I used to describe it, because the first question you get asked is about, like, what's women's rugby? How many lesbians are there? Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, that's just fucking rude to start with. And that's, that's very much, this is going back a little bit, the opinion of a lot of 
males around women's rugby, let's be honest. Um, and then I find myself going, hold on a minute. It's the same game, but different. All right, so that's the way I used to describe it. And it is, it's the same game, but it's, it's slightly different because um, just because of the athleticism within the game. So in terms of kicking, there's not as much kicking because there's the, the kicking ability throughout a whole squad is not always... Well, they can't pump a ball 40, 50 metres, just genetically. Unless you're Emily Scarrett. Unless you're Scars or unless you're Zoe Harrison. and But that I think that's through them. I've been seeing the likes of Maggie and those growing up and being having an interest in it and going and, and playing it longer. So what happens or happened a lot is a lot of women and girls would come to it quite late. So that development period, a bit like you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never kicked the ball. Yeah. Well, once it actually but, for the Barbarians, yeah. it went straight off my heel into, into touch, but <laughs> it got a cheer. Yeah. I don't, it's, it's, it's difficult. I don't want to sound derogatory to it at all, but that is a fair comment around the kicking side of it. That's fair. Uh, I think Flats said it about Scars in the World Cup one year. But it? I think being fair and being balanced, you're in a perfect position. If yeah. I start saying that, they'd be like, yeah. oh, you know, what's, you know, what, the, yeah. what does Jim know? But you do know. Yeah. And, I, and it's, and that side of the game, is is a big area of growth. Uh, in terms of handling and physicality, it's fucking been there for years. It's amazing. It's great, and it's it's sort of. I've I remember I was. There is a pre bias in society, and there's a pre bias in 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 rugby towards women. And I I champion women. I always have. Like my the, the most important people in my life and role models have all been women. So Georgie being one of those. If Georgie hadn't come into my life. Fuck knows where my rugby career would have gone because I was a loose cannon and had no control. And like she'd come in and she just properly reined in. And I, and it's where I had res- I got respect for her from what she was doing playing for England. So she'd, she'd do a 5 a.m. gym session. She'd go to work. She'd drive up to Bristol, come back, then go to England training and do all this shit around her own life. I'm getting paid, albeit, what, 30 grand at Pirates, moaning about a, fucking going to a, a running session. Mm. It's like, actually, Gully, wind your neck in and work a bit harder. And, and and she had that impact on me. So, and then watching, watching her growth within the game and then watching her and how still, still when she was playing for England, it's, it was still an afterthought. So it was great to play at Twickenham, but who wants to watch two games of rugby at Twickenham on a Saturday in the freezing cold in November? And you've watched some of the most, like England beating New Zealand recently, England beat New Zealand at Isha, years ago when Georgie was playing or at Twickenham and the story just wasn't told. It was just a bit of an afterthought. Oh yeah, we better put this on because uh, it's the right thing to do, which is bullshit. That's just blokes being fucking prejudiced and sexist and all that shit that goes on within, within the RFU or wherever it is. It might be the RFU, those decision makers. I just get so frustrated with it. Um, but it's, it's, it's like great seeing it now and it's just sort of championing those stories and being able to and I think they see an opportunity of growth. And the, the growth is new supporters. You go to Twickenham, it's the same people every year. It's that demographic of white middle class, but majority that are there watching rugby, watching their whole lives, whatever. Women's rugby is, the opportunity in women's rugby is a new audience. The rugby hasn't had this opportunity for, well, since, it, since its inception, I don't think. So, you know, there's an opportunity. I watch you look at the Chiefs down at Chiefs when England played there, or you go to Donny or whatever. You look at the people watching that game of rugby. It's families, it's kids, it's girls, and they're having a great day. And they're going to go to their local rugby club and they're going to take their family with them and their family are going to come into the rugby club. They're going to buy a beer, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And it's just it's just a massive opportunity for for growth for the game. And I think it the women's game will benefit the men's game rather than the men's game benefiting the women's game. And I think that, that's the opportunity. And that's the way I'd like to see it to go. And I think you can kind of see it. It needs, I don't think it should follow the men's model at all at, at, at Prem level. Um, I don't think they should be playing through the winter. I think it should move to the summer and become its own family day out. And then it becomes a, a viable, sustainable revenue stream for a, a club as well. So break the mould a bit on it. There's an opportunity. There's, there's great role models within the game, isn't there? In the women's side, they're getting bigger and bigger. But then for it to become a really commercially successful um, competition, it needs fans and it needs supporters watching it week in, week out. And they're hopefully the people that are watching England now on the road shows that will go and support their clubs locally. Yeah, I think what we come to think of in rugby, and it all started from Jonah Lomu, 
is athletes, right? Yeah, people, you say it a bit on the other one, don't you? Like, they transcend the game. Yeah. Players that transcend the game, but also, and again, this is, there's an element of us going away from big hits and, yeah. you know, big carries, the excitement where NFL, where you'd watch NFL highlights, for example, and it'd be people getting absolutely fucking minced in the tackle. Yeah. And that's what you want to see. Rugby's slightly moving away from that. Yeah. Offloads, you know, big tries, celebrations, fan experience. And I think from my point of view and seeing some of the women come through now is the way that they'll take the leap is by the athletes coming through. Yeah. And rugby is the ultimate team sport. Yeah. But I think in order to grow the game from a men and female perspective is... You need that. Yeah. You, you need your Mara Togis, your Emily Scarrett, your Sonny Bill Williams, yeah. your Jim... You got it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need the good lads. They've all got good lads. <laughs> but I think that that's what it needs. And Poppy Cleals. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of, of course. Of yeah. course. So the money in the women's game, I want to, like, I think you, you know again how, how it looks. How much are the women getting paid? So, in terms of the funding, that again seems to be a bit of a token gesture, similar to the championship. It almost not, not doesn't seem to be an afterthought. Clubs, think and know they have to do something in the women's space so it's almost like right well what are we going to do here because we can't not have a women's team because because everyone else is doing it yeah and also fucking reason uh, exactly (laughs) but that that is probably why they are doing it but also commercially like you think an Allianz or a Nike or an Adidas these are big just to name three are companies that are like right okay well what are you doing in women's sport how are you empowering women oh damn shit we're not we need to put we need to put something together yeah are the women being paid well enough to be professional? Uh, the England contracts, yes. But again, I don't know exact figures, but I know they're tiered. So very much like the UK athletics used to be, but it's through England rugby. And I think, again, it's similar to what the champ, between 25 and 35, depending on what level of rugby player you are. Uh, and that's the EPS, so your elite player squad. They'll all be contracted between those figures, I believe. Um, I don't know how. And that's probably been that way for three years I think club level there's a bit of money that knocks around now um, which is new for the girls and like I had chats with quite a few of them and how they pitch themselves and and in a new contract and what their worth is etc so but again that's 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 sort of a match fee or a retainer but you're not going to be earning over 12 grand through a club club contract anywhere you might get accommodation but they have to stay within their salary cap of I think it was 80 grand for the year and I think it's up to 120 now. I think that might be wrong, but it's not a lot of money to fund 30, 30 players. Um, so yeah, it's not a great deal of money, but it's more than they were getting when Georgie was playing. Mm. So it's, it's going the right way. Where's the beacon? Where's the one that they look up to and be like, is it an Emily Scarrett? And be Scars, like, by yeah. Is that because commercially she's got stuff with Adidas and involved in a podcast and does sponsorship deals. She, I coached Scars at Litchfield when Georgie was playing there. So we had Scars, Mo, Georgie, um, just though there was loads of England girls there. It was, it was awesome. Great coaching experience. She is by far and away the best person I've coached or been involved with in rugby and that athletic ability and skill level and talk about humble. She is, she's just a lovely person. And like, she is, She's she's just a great rugby player first, great person. She's the, she's the beacon, yeah, um, of of the women's game for me, and that's the one I think. And she knows she's got her own podcast, doesn't she? And she's, and I don't know how comfortable she is. She's a farmer, and but she sees an opportunity. And this is how self aware Skaz is. She she knows she's in the public eye, and she knows an opportunity then to help grow the game through speaking and talking about it positively. Yeah, she's yeah she's she's bloody good egg that one. Yeah. I mean, when I look at her, that's what I think. It's almost. It rests on her shoulders right now. <laughs> no pressure, Scars. Like, yeah, like yeah. no pressure at all. But she seems to be the right person to do oh, it. She, yeah, because of the reasons that I've said. I, in order for the women's game to grow, there needs to be an athleticism yeah. element to it. And she looks like an athlete. Yeah, she plays like an athlete. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But the way that she speaks and the fact that she's got appetite to put herself out there—it's yeah. not easy, is it? Like no. we're sat, we were talking about it before. Like it's not easy no. when the cameras are on. No. And doing a podcast and trying to contextualize yeah, not try, yeah. everything, not just making a tackle or playing rugby, just yeah. trying to contextualize life, like, anything. But they're quite they're quite deep subjects as well, aren't they? Like this, we're talking 
this is like a society level as well, isn't it? And it's and it's like, yeah, I have experience. I'm not a woman, so I can't. So you find yourself second guessing, pausing, pausing, umming, thinking, yeah, ah-ing, going, yeah. you knowing, you knowing, yeah. Um, uh, but at the same time, I've experienced it from. I think so. I get very protective. I coach a, a women's team at the moment. Georgie's my head coach, which is which is a different dynamic, um, which is good fun. But I, I, I go into protection mode, and I hate the fact that I have to go into protection mode because someone might say something. A bloke in the clubhouse might say, "Oh." Ooh, she's all right. Or, oh, look, they can play rugby. Oh, they can kick a rugby ball. It's like, come on, guys. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're in a different world now. Let's, let's embrace it. Let's just see it for what it is. And- but that's why it's right that me and you sit chatting about it because yeah. I'm not overly comfortable talking about it. No. I don't 100% know how I feel about it. I don't think much of it. Yeah. But I think the fact that me and you, I'm going to put us in the mould of alpha male. Bloody love it. Because basically we got a beard. We've got a beard. So I think we are. It probably yeah. better to migrate through it. Um and ah, you knows, who knows, mm, mm, pause. And what I said to you before, the podcast, I'm quite happy to make mistakes, right? Yeah. I, there's no point me pussyfooting through life with four kids, trying to be PC yeah. and trying to say what I think other people want me to say. I'd yeah. rather be corrected and be like, well, actually, you said this. You said this on the rugby pod. You said this. You and Gully were chatting about this. You didn't seem overly comfortable about talking about it. Yeah. Or you're wrong. I'll be like, yeah, great. Thank you. Mm. Enlighten me. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's part of the journey of doing think, this podcast. Yeah. I think the women's game is like, like I, I know I've spoke to you about it before when you've come to watch it. And you did the piece on Saris, didn't you? I did. Well, one thing that, again, without cutting you off, Obviously, we've known each other, mentioned it for 20-odd yeah. years. Not just your career, yeah. but every time I see you misses play or involved in rugby, you're there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Six yeah. foot six, yeah. beard, not embarrassed at all. No, proud. Proud yeah. to be stood there and enjoying it and loving it. Yeah. And I and that's what that's what yeah. I want to talk about it because <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I think it's great. I yeah. I, I I think it's awesome to see. Yeah. No, it's we and George, I think we're quite unique in that, but we supported each other through through our rugby careers. And it was it was never it was never chore for us. So Georgie come watch me on a Saturday, I'll go watch her on a Sunday, or vice versa. And and I don't want to sound caught. Cool. No, I don't mind saying it. I'm I'm proud to say that some of my best days in rugby were watching Georgie play for England, travelling up on a train, having a couple of beers, going to watch her play against New Zealand. And then at the end of a career, like her running off the field, winning against um, Quinns, crying. And I've never seen her cry. You know, they, but like going there, just proud as punch on the side. That's my wife. Yeah, <laughs> raw. Raw. Just, and that's how I felt. I love, I love you. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> but, and then the year before when she was thinking about retiring and she was, we were at Ealing in the Prem final and, and they shouldn't have won that game. It was a great game of rugby. And I've never... All my playing, all my coaching, watching that game, fuck me, I was a bag of wrecks, a bag of nerves, mate. I was, I was, didn't know how to feel. And after, the emotion I felt was just nothing I'd ever felt before because I thought that was it for her and they shouldn't have won the game and they did. And I stood behind the cameraman trying to look at the time on the sky camera because there's no bloody clock at Ealing. And I'm peppering and he just goes, you fuck off. I'm like, that's my wife on the bench. I want <laughs> She's to know, my wife. I want to know the score or how long is left. But yeah, those, those, those days, like watching a watching George play, were great. But also watching the growth of the game through it as well. It's it's been quite nice to be on that part. I've not part of the journey. Just watch watch it. You've definitely been part of the journey from yeah. from where I've viewed the women's game, and maybe that's just through Do my lenses. Turned me from my probably where where you were at at some point, maybe in the last few years. Was I went England were playing? Um, who were they playing? Italy or someone? at London Welsh in the end of the Six Nations uh, and they Georgie was playing and they they won the Six Nations I think they won like four on a spin Grand Slams at London Welsh old dear putt so oh, what do I do here everyone's getting on the beers oh fancy staying up and they used to stay at the Shepparton so I snuck on their bus right so I'm sat don't tell me they're chopping piss on the bus <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's mental I was fear, I was scared so I sat on the back of the bus I don't even know if the coaches knew I was on it Fuck those out. But I was at the back just like that. And then, oh my God, mate. This trip was only like half an hour. It was kicking off on there. You and felt I, part of them. I felt part of the team. 
felt like I was an England player. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, and then I, I was like, this is brilliant, amazing. And like, and I don't know. I just, I just got a love for it, and, I, and I've also got a real care, care for the the girls that are in it. And I, you know, I speak to a lot of them still now. Um, and they, they, they message me. I have a good friendship with with Poppy and, and Rocky as well. And it's, I've got my own relationships and friendships with them. And it just, I don't guide them, but it's just nice to if they've got a question around contracts or money or you know they can, they can fire away. I, I might not know the answer, but they know that they can. They can they can reach out if needed, but it's um, it's definitely going in the right way. But it's it's I think if you don't know about it, it's difficult. But it's like anything; if you don't know, you're going to feel uncomfortable about it, aren't you? Well, I don't know anything about squash. How you know, much talk about squash? I don't know about it. <laughs> I don't know. It's unbelievably fast, and you've got to be nimble and agile, which we're not. Mm-hmm. Gully, absolutely love that, mate. Yeah. If you want to. Give a shout out to your podcast. What's it called? I don't know whether you want to put your social media out there. You're not. You're old school. You're not that much on social media, are you? Oh, I love it. Do you? Yeah. All right. Well, what's your social media handle and how do listeners get hold of your so podcast? Go, the podcast is um, Championship Clubs Podcast. So it just rolls off the tongue, that one. Championship Clubs Podcast. CCP. That's it, yeah. Um, you find us on Twitter, Instagram. Oh, mate. I'm, as if I'm, as I love if, it. Come on. As if Come we're on. doing this. Right, me. What am I on there? Uh, on Instagram, I am at Ben Gully thirteen. Uh, Twitter at Ben Gully. I know he does Facebook anymore. I don't. Do nah, it. they don't no, do no. Facebook. No, no, they're the two main ones. Uh, and if you want to buy a uh, a Land Rover or Range Rover, come and find me at Roger Young um, Land Rover in Saltash in the Southwest. So those guys down there are great. But yeah, if you're looking for a new car, I'm your man. I'll be there. <laughs> Cheers for listening, guys. <laughs> Cheers, mate.